now see it person to person a weekly document for television as told by the faces and voices of people in the news
Senator Carroll with us today to celebrate Independence Day, and he is an independent politician. In fact, so independent that some say they don't know which party he does belong to. Austin Tucker. Austin is with us today as the political advisor to Senator Carroll. Austin, we hear, or people say, that there is some possibility that you want to get the nomination for Senator Carroll next year. Oh, well, I think we're jumping the gun there, Miss Carter. We also hear... He's not running for any other office. He's concentrating on the one he has now. father if you're young enough, the ideal husband if you're old enough, and I guess the ideal leader of our country, so says Austin Tucker, if you're any age. Uh, yes, Lee, how are you? Senator Carroll, just fine, thank you. Yeah, Welcome fine. to our city. Yeah. How do you do? How are you? You all look just as wonderful as you do in all your photographs. How do you manage that? Always smiling. Well, I'll tell you, we're very happy in that breed smiling faces, and I'm happy to be with my constituents today on such a wonderful day. Independence Day. Thank, thank you very you. much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you so much. Right. Welcome okay, thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, you've been invited here today for the official announcement of the inquiry into the death of Senator Charles Carroll. Now, this is an announcement, not a press conference. Therefore, there will be no questions. A complete transcript of the investigation is being prepared for publication on March 1st. At that time, the committee will hold a full-scale press conference. After nearly four months of investigation, followed by nine weeks of hearings, it is the conclusion of this committee that Senator Carroll was assassinated by Thomas Richard Linder. It is our further conclusion that he acted entirely alone, motivated by a misguided sense of patriotism and a psychotic desire for public recognition. The committee wishes to emphasize that there is no evidence of any wider conspiracy. No evidence whatsoever. Now, it's our hope that this will put an end to the kind of irresponsible and exploitive speculation conducted by the press in recent months. As I've said, the complete text of the hearings, which provides the basis for the committee's findings, will be published March 1st. When you have had a chance to examine the evidence, you will have every opportunity to ask those questions which remain unanswered, if there are any. That is all. Thank you. Look. What? Oh, come on. I looked at this fellow. I was blue in the face three years ago. Since the assassination, six of these people have died in some kind of an accident. Four. Look, nobody's trying to kill you, huh? These people were killed. And whoever killed them is going to try to kill me. Austin Tucker thinks so, too. Austin thinks that maybe we all saw something up there. Yeah, well, we did see something up there, didn't we? No, I mean something else. Well, what do you mean by something else? Does he ever indicate what he means by that? Has he ever indicated to you that he saw anything other than what was in the commission report? No. Nothing? No. Did you see anything up there? No. Well, neither did I. And believe me, I looked. We all looked. You mean if you didn't see it, it's not there. Well, I didn't say that. It's just that I know all about these accidents. Ralph Scaletta was a known lush. He hit a piling on the George Washington Bridge. He killed three other people with him. Joy Holder died of anaphylactic shock when the doctor gave her the wrong antibiotic. Herbert Moon burned himself up in bed smoking, which his girlfriend always told him he was going to do, and Harry Lutz had a heart attack. Harry Lutz was 40 years old. It's too young to have a heart attack. Oh, it's not. He was thin. He was in uh, terrific bullshit. condition. Bullshit. He found out his wife was banging her psychiatrist, and on the same day, a bulldozer accidentally knocked over half his house. Come on. He was lucky to last that long. That's future shock, Lee. You mean you no longer believe that there was another assassin involved in shooting Carol? That's right. But it was an explanation. People were crazy for any kind of explanation then. Every time you turned around, some nut was knocking off one of the best men in the country. Okay. But there are six out of 18 dead. Four? That was the last time you looked. Since then, Norman Lomax has died. And now Arthur Bridges. What are you talking about? A fishing accident? Where the hell is Salmon Tail? Salmon Tail is where Austin Tucker is now. I tried to reach him. Well? Why don't you call him? Sam and Tail looks like a small town. Take me. Take me there. We could we could catch a plane and we could be there this evening. Mm -hmm. Natalie. Please. Let's call him up. It's a fishing accident. You want to hear about my day? I got some real problems. <laughs> you Thanks. son of a bitch! <laughs> you don't care! enough alcohol and barbiturates in her bloodstream to have killed her if she'd fallen asleep in bed, let alone at the wheel of a car. Now, would you call it a possible homicide? Face it, some people want to die. Excuse me.
one of the curses of the modern television age uh, is that it puts far too much attention on appearance rather than substance, on froth uh, rather than uh, what the beer is really like. Uh, no, I, uh, I've, I've never had any regrets about uh, that people don't think I'm a charismatic figure. <laughs> It's like, I'm sure my, my parents, would, like when John F. Kennedy died and shit, they made a big deal over that, and I can't really understand that, but that was their thing. I would have rather had the president killed than have Kurt Cobain shoot himself in the head. <laughs> I hate the president right now. I have no respect for Bill Clinton at all. I don't have respect for any of the <laughs> presidents. man is dead from a shotgun wound to the head. Now there was a suicide note left inside the, the house. Amount of coffee, grunge, and heroin. Um, so we know that Cobain was a heroin addict. Let's and talk. Kurt Cobain was, ladies and gentlemen, I just, he was a worthless shred of human debris who had been in, had been trying to kill himself for 12 years and finally did it right by using a shotgun so he couldn't miss. And, and I'll tell you, the way the media has been playing this guy up has just offends my sensibilities to no end. This is going to be another, yeah, this is going to be another, like, JFK thing. I mean, I've already heard so many conspiracy theories that he actually committed suicide in his house out in the suburbs and was brought back here and it was arranged or he was shot. I've heard so many things already. Yeah. He shipped home in December, discharged in March. Section 8, mentally disturbed. No, it's too pat, it's too pat. All the pieces go together. We could put a ribbon around this one and mail it in. Except for one thing. say I still don't know what you think you'll find, Steve. Could be we missed something. Set it up again, Shin. Why aren't you buying it, Steve? It all fits. Yeah. Slow it down. Can you focus better? Say. 
Sunny. Now an autopsy has failed to determine what caused the death of a Seattle rock musician. Kristen Pfaff belonged to the punk rock band Hole. The band is headed by Courtney Love, widow of grunge star Kurt Cobain. He committed suicide in April. Como's Enrique Cerna reports toxicology tests will be conducted to see if Pfaff died from a drug overdose. Kristen Pfaff was last seen alive on Wednesday night. She'd been with two friends at her Capitol Hill apartment. About 9.30, she left them to take a bath. The next morning, a friend found Pfaff in the tub, dead. Police say syringes and other drug paraphernalia were found nearby. The 27-year-old Pfaff joined the band Hole last year. The group's record company says she had a history of heroin abuse, and this past winter entered a drug rehabilitation program. In a telephone interview from his Denver home, Pfaff's father says he believes she had overcome any past drug problems. And if she was on Wednesday night, that, you know, that's a tragedy. And, uh, but I don't, I don't have any reason to believe it was anything that was regular or, or uh, something that she wanted as part of her lifestyle. Surviving members of Hole issued a statement this afternoon saying, We are obviously shaken by the recent tragedies affecting our band but have decided to continue on as a band after we regroup, collect our thoughts, and mourn the passing of a very loved person. If toxicology tests confirm Pfaff's death as drug-related, she will become the third major Seattle rock musician to die from an overdose in the last four years. In the Kristen Pfaff case, toxi toxicology results will be known in four to six weeks. Pfaff's body will be flown to Buffalo, New York, where she'll be buried before the coroner's office knows exactly what caused the death of grunge band member Kristen Pfaff. The 27-year-old bass player for the group Hole was found dead inside her Capitol Hill apartment in Seattle yesterday morning. Police reports indicate drug paraphernalia was found near her body, but an autopsy today did not conclude if Pfaff died from a drug overdose. Toxicology tests are... He had to have killed himself. I mean, why would you actually kill him? Is there like a reason to? Well, he was involved in contractual matters dealing with millions and millions of dollars with many people, including record company executives. You don't trust record company executives, do you? Yeah, but why would you kill someone who's bringing you in money? They lose money by killing them, so... Maybe he didn't want to work for them any longer? I'm just an idea. Yeah, but if he's going to go, just go. I mean, killing him isn't going to make anything better unless he made money off his death. Don't you think someone might do that? No. I think Courtney Love did, bring out her CD right after it, he died. 
And now they got the unplugged CD. I think they're everyone's trying to make money off of it. <laughs> I don't know, I guess he killed himself. Well, was the question? He's just a heroin freak. Any any doubts about Kurt Cobain having killed himself? I don't give a shit, dude. It's been like mass fucking long ago. <laughs> Three months ago. Oh, well, that was, that's a long time. No, I'll be totally honest with you. I mean, no, don't mess around right now. <laughs> uh, I think he did kill himself, but I think it was Courtney Love's fault. <laughs> Why do you say that? Because she was probably messing She's around with him, you know. Messing around with his head, you mean? Or probably is. What if I told you that uh, he's supposed to have shot himself in the mouth with a 20 gauge shotgun, right? That. There was no blood around the head. You find that hard to believe? Uh, what do you think I would happen? I don't know that much about it. I. I couldn't say anything about that. All I read was in the paper. I don't see how the shotgun got from his temple to under his chin, but that's another story. Well, what, what if I told you that the medical examiner now says that there was no wound, there was no exit wound, there was no blood around the head, no substantial wound? Well, then I'd say he was murdered, basically. And why do you think that someone would uh, murder him? Drug debt, uh, speaking his mind. Uh, <laughs> speaking your mind is a dangerous thing these days, you think? I would say so. I'd say it's always been a dangerous thing. Look at the Salem witch trials. But now, it was very easy for you to conclude that if it wasn't one thing, which is the usual uh, death by shotgun, if there was, for instance, no wound and no blood, then it must be something else completely different. Right? I would say so. Don't you think maybe there ought to be an investigation? I guess the real question is, would you believe, that if, if the police are the only ones that say he killed himself, would you believe what the police said? I think that they should get more than one opinion. I think that they should have somebody else go and look at the corpse. Of course, it was burned five days after uh, it was discovered. Well, then that could either say that they were covering up the evidence, or that was just his wish to be cremated when he was killed, well, when he died. But there was no, there was no will, actually, so he didn't specify that. I think they should talk to Courtney Love. On some of the other stories making news in the Northwest tonight, King County Medical Examiner say Seattle musician Kristen Pfaff did not intend to kill herself. They say her drug overdose last month was accidental. Pfaff played for the alternative band Hole, a band headed by Courtney Love, the widow of Nirvana's Kurt Cobain. She was found dead in the bathtub of her Capitol Hill apartment one month ago. Hello, I'm Richard Lee. Psychoanalysis has revealed to us, wrote Sigmund Freud in his Totem and Taboo, that the totem animal is really a substitute for the father, and this really explains to us the contradiction that it is usually forbidden to kill the totem animal that the killing of it results in a holiday, and that the animal is killed yet mourned. Freud here is getting at something that is very instructive in this day and age in which the myth-making machines of media and the movies actually constitutes America's second ranking export item only second in international trade to our selling of lethal weapons. The mechanism of fame is probably most clearly distinguished by the seemingly endless repetition of a pattern of the building up of a celebrated person to superhuman heights of status that seem to both ennoble and trivialize the lives of we ordinary humans, only to have both perceptions of our relative positions to the high and mighty 
intensified as we watch their fatal flaws revealed as they fly too close to the sun only to burn and crash in the most rarefied version of the phenomena of fame that of the tragic drama from the early days of 20th century fame's first fanzine photogenic star the great war's red baron through hitler and james dean and now oj simpson nothing satisf satisfies the public's primal fascination with the larger than life better than the spectacle of a fallen falling star as freud observed it is usually forbidden to kill the totem animal but when the totem animal is killed it results in a holiday in today's vernacular we call this a media circus and then the animal is killed yet mourned and of course there is not so pure a form of this killing of the noble totem animal that is to say there is no so pure a form of this killing of the noble totem animal than that of assassination if ever the american machinery of fame and fortune and misfortune of the famous were to reach its most refined form it would be in the form of rashes of assassinations shocking at first these news dramas would become the piece de resistance of the daily diet of news on crime and corruption in a nation of capone wannabes packing pistols and whacking other wannabes points being gained in the assassination wars for the ranking of one's victim in the governmental or corporate hierarchy the problem with this bleak picture is the very messiness of it all history seems to show that warrior spirit bloodthirst is never a permanent sort of thing that the most menacing of marauders eventually long for the quiet domestic life of a hagar the horrible from the funny pages a friend of mine in high school had a genuine talent for science fiction and years ago showed me a story that solved this messy splatter fest of any conceivable american assassination wars his idea was that this could all be a whole lot more fun if the assassinations were made technologically more palatable by eliminating the bloody messes altogether in fact even doing away with the actual fact of homicide in the assassinations altogether this would be accomplished by drugs and electronics so his fi sci-fi story postulated that would enable terrorist hit squads to carry out what he called personality kidnappings as far as i can remember the story went something like this although in the year 2010 a good deal of research indicated that it might be possible to electronically transfer memories and even the innate personalities of persons perhaps to storage disks or into fetal monkey brains for ethical reasons no public funding could be used to conduct this type of research still weird tales were occasionally leaking from top secret laboratories of some of the wealthiest corporations that this work in electro-cerebral transfer was moving along at its own swift pace the world at large had no clear picture of what kind of horrors were possible until one day when the pope touring through the slums of rome was hustled away into a waiting fiat by a gang of suspected bulgarians or some such thing the police authorities were quite relieved when only three out hours later they found the pope wandering these same city streets still decked out in a clean flowing white robe their relief was not to last long though as they soon discovered that the pope was no longer at all who he was before now they found the pope was only able to talk 
and very enthusiastically, I might add, not about theological matters, which he seemed to have forgotten all about, but rather he showed a great concern for soccer scores and raunchy humor and American brands of cigarettes. He also seemed to have a complete working knowledge of every brothel and gambling den presently in operation from one end of Rome to the other, and continually suggested to his papal assistants that they ought to go out all night to hit his favorite hot spots. It didn't take long for the Pope's secret service to figure this one out. The Pope's personality had been kidnapped, and left in its place was the personality of a slovenly, bad-mannered, thrice-divorced Roman cab driver. Presumably somewhere out there was a cab driver who had suddenly mysteriously acquired a considerable new degree of skill in Latin, just for starters. Before long, other brands of high-tech desperados, that is, other bands of high-tech desperados, had figured out how this could be done using microcomputers, old camcorder parts, and beehive hair dryers from the 1960s, and personalities were being kidnapped right and left. The great fun of it all for everyone was that it was almost exclusively the rich and famous who had their personas spirited away. In the case of ransoms being paid, in a few cases, personalities were sloppily restored, but most cases remained completely unsolved. This had somehow made the whole idea of assassination quite a lot of fun. No blood was spilled, and in theory anyway, there was a cab driver or monkey brain out there being used as storage space for all of the victims, so in theory, just about anyone could have an almost complete recovery if he could just locate the reservoir of his memory. The cases started happening all the time, like to star athletes just before big championship games, showing up somewhere speaking Farsi and reciting the Koran, only to have a non-athletically endowed cab driver show up for the big game, insisting that he be admitted so that he could lead his team to victory. And so it was, too, in the death the killing of a taboo animal named Kurt Cobain. No mere whacking for the sake of getting someone out of the way, the Cobain killing was executed with not mere flair, not just a dramatic framework, not even just a Hollywood quality level of drama, but it was not even so much an executed killing as, as nearly as I can determine, it was an orchestrated killing, written for a grand proscenium stage as big as all the televisual world, true grand opera on the theme of a big celebrity bites the dust. Adolf Hitler, no part-time opera buff himself, would have loved it, given it a big palms up, and, uh, of course, I'm sure that some of you realize that this faked suicide thing has a direct parallel in the life of Adolf H. As you may know, his 23-year-old niece, with whom he was believed to be having an affair, was killed in a suspicious suicide by handgun crime scene in Mr. H's apartment in the early 1930s, a drama that Herr H. lived through and probably toughened him up just prior to his early 1930s rapid ascent to superstardom as the world's first, we might say arguably the world's first, and most musically untalented rock star, or rock type star, we might say. And so here I am discussing the murder of Kurt Cobain in terms of assassination. Could we ever doubt that this, that it is just precisely that? 
Could 50 million Elvis fans be wrong, as an Elvis album cover once asked? Maybe, but they were also certainly loyal. And one cannot doubt the loyalty of more than 10 million Nirvana fans, who voted for Kurt as pop culture leader with their greenbacks. Voting, as I'm sure you've noticed, does not involve any direct fee, but uh, the same cannot be said of the acquisition of a compact disc, which costs about $15. As you may realize, $15 is exactly all that a Perot supporter is asked to pony up to push their man toward the White House. Perot's membership figures are still a closely guarded secret the last time I checked, but I doubt that his United We Stand America has anything close to 10 million members. With all album sales combined, Kurt Cobain's record sales are probably more like 15 million units, which means that as far as persons voting with their $15 expenditure, Cobain probably got two to three times as many dollar votes in 1992 as did Ross Perot. And if Perot got close to 20% of the vote in the 92 election, well, you get the idea. On that scale, Kurt Cobain would rate to f as 40 to 60% of the popular vote. That is extrapolating the uh, dollar vote to popular vote, comparing Cobain and, and Perot. You get the idea. And so in 1992, when Nirvana's Nevermind album was released, it was Kurt Cobain not Ross Perot, who was the all-time champion independent campaign fundraiser. And so the description of our findings of this investigation in this series of programs uh, to our description, we can now add that not only was Kurt Cobain murdered, but that Kurt Cobain was assassinated, as he, as he was, of course, a public figure, a political figure of sorts, elected by the low-wage earnings of Generation X to the office of the President of the United States of Grunge. As we would have to do in a sophisticated, and uh, in fact we would have to do a sophisticated socioeconomic analysis to offer an intelligent view on this, but one can wonder if these theoretical United States of Grunge might be soon to rival the size of the United States of mainstream America. And we might additionally add the very significant description that this was not just a murder, not just an assassination, but also a low-tech execution of what we have been calling in this program a personality kidnapping. Mr. Cobain's body may have been wrapped up, given a cursory autopsy, and then burned only six days after it was discovered, but his reputation, metaphorically, was tied to a mule and dragged through the mud and dung of the town square, where it was covered over and given a grave marker reading only heroin and suicide. Nearly every news agency in the, n n nearly every news agency in the world rushed to report within hours, based on statements from the P Seattle Police Department and the King County Medical Examiner, that Cobain had committed suicide. But in 14 weeks of my investigation, as well as a good deal of telephone salesmanship uh, on my part, no media source has been convinced, uh, to my knowledge, to ever utter so much as a word of suspicion about the possibility of the murder of Kurt Cobain. Despite, I would contend, rather overwhelming evidence. That is, overwhelming evidence that the murder scenario is far more plausible than the suicide scenario, uh, given what we've discussed on this program in the last 13 weeks. And now we have to deal with the scandal of the handling of the death of Ms. Kristen Pfaff, bass player in Mr. Cobain's widow's band, Hole, who was found dead in the bathtub of her Capitol Hill apartment on June 15th. 
As of yesterday, the King County Medical Examiner ruled, after a lapse of nearly a month since her death, that, that Ms. Pfaff died of a drug overdose, an opiate overdose, they say, administered, they claim, by a needle. The way that this investigation proceeded, that is, the police and medical examiner, and their investigation is very curious indeed. On June 15th, police responded to a call that Ms. Pfaff was found dead by a friend in her bathtub. The officers at the scene called the homicide department and discussed the scene and circumstances and arrived at a decision that this was going to be handled, so I was told, as a suicide, according to the Seattle Police Department, meaning that no investigation was necessary. All they needed to do was hand the case over to the King County Medical Examiner, who then told the media that they needed to wait at least a month to get toxicology tests back to demonstrate that this was what it appeared to be at the scene, a drug overdose. Now those tests are back as of yesterday, and the King County Medical Examiner calls the case an accidental drug overdose. So now in theory, the ball is back in the court of the Seattle Police Department. Since it was not a suicide as they originally treated it, it must be a homicide. Either it is a case of controlled substances homicide, if someone gave her or sold her the drug, and it is a case of murder if someone slipped her the drug, say, for instance, in food or a drink. So will the Seattle Police Department now get busy with a homicide investigation? Well, in theory, we can wait for this to occur, but uh, I would uh, advise don't hold your breath for this. You see, the police found, they say, syringes on the premises, just like they found that heroin shooting kit that very mysteriously showed up next to Kurt Cobain's body. The reason that they were able to treat it as a suicide initially is that they say that there was nothing suspicious about the scene or circumstances, so they say. But what about the fact that almost all of Ms. Pfaff's belongings were already loaded onto a U-Haul truck parked in front of her building, and that she was supposed to have been driving back to her former residence of Minneapolis only hours before her death occurred. Or rather, that is to say, they were uh, to depart on this driving trip of uh, about 1,500 miles to Minneapolis only hours after her death actually occurred. Uh, her and a friend from Minneapolis. This would be a mighty strange time to take a massive dose of heroin, wouldn't you say? Especially since Ms. Pfaff's parents do not feel that she was, in fact, a narcotics abuser. So you or, that is to say, to you or to me, these and other factors would spell out suspicious circumstances in neon lights but apparently to the Seattle Police Department, they spelled suicide for some reason. Now, a month later, nearly a month later, ruled accidental. And so now that the medical examiner has ruled that it was not suicide, should we expect finally an investigation into the death of Kristen Pfaff? Well, yes, of course we should, but like I said, don't hold your breath. As nearly as I can tell, the Seattle Police Department never investigated, has never ever investigated, a case of drug overdose on a basis of controlled substances homicide. Although there are dozens of such overdoses which could be investigated this way each year, no investigations are ever performed even under the very suspicious circumstances like those surrounding the death of Kristen Pfaff. And as we've argued, offered, opined in previous editions of this program, one of the likely reasons that they handled the Kristen Pfaff case this way, that is to treat it as a suicide until such time when the 
medical examiner's report came back indicating that it was an accidental drug overdose, which again occurred just yesterday. One of the reasons that, of course, they felt compelled to handle it this way, despite the very suspicious circumstances, is that, of course, an investigation into Ms. Pfaff's death would be merely an extension into the death of Kurt Cobain, whose murderer at this time, May, uh, is, of course, as of yet unknown, but let's face it, the coincidence is uh, rather compelling. Perhaps the people who killed Kurt Cobain were also involved in the death of Kristen Pfaff, and this is, of course, what the police would not want to do anything in the way of investigating. And so that's nearly all the time we have for this evening, of course. Uh, those of you who have seen previous episodes, uh, editions of this program, uh, know better on a factual basis what I've been getting at. And uh, I'm sure you can appreciate that with 14 uh, of these programs now in the can, that uh, that is in the film can, as they say, uh, in the film world, that is uh, 14 editions behind us. Uh, I tend to get a little bit creative sometimes in the writing of the description of these programs, but I'm sure you can appreciate the very serious aspects of my calling the Kurt Cobain homicide, murder, as very akin to an assassination in terms of especially the sophistication of the crime and also, uh, we might say uh, very seriously, we have to consider, given the weight of the crime and the fact that this is in many ways a crime against society in a very, in a very uh, definite sense in terms of Mr. Cobain being a beloved public figure, uh, we have to wonder really just where the police had their head when they were supposed to be doing an investigation. That is where they had their collective head or where they had their heads when they were supposed to be doing a homicide investigation into the death of Kurt Cobain. That is to say, as we've argued and demonstrated, I think rather convincingly, the murder of Kurt Cobain. So uh, please join me again next week, this time the station, for a further and probably closer examination of facts next week. And I appreciate your participation as members of the audience. They should get more than one opinion. I think that they should have somebody else go and look at the corpse. Of course, it was burned five days after uh, it was discovered. Well, then that could either say that they were covering up the evidence, or that was just his wish to be cremated when he was killed, well, when he died. But there was no, there was no will, actually, so he didn't specify that. I think they should talk to Courtney Love.